nothing in all my years of practicing medicine improves humans more than getting rid of visceral fat. Nothing, nothing else comes as close. Hey carnivores, welcome back to the channel. It's me, Bella the Steak and Butter Gal. I hope you all are having an amazing day. And as usual, how's your carnivore journey going? Your commented updates and struggles always give me a better idea of how I can better help you. Today, I have the honor to have you all meet Dr. Sean O'Mara. He is the doctor and expert for decreasing and melting visceral fat. The exact steps and routines to start melting that visceral fat, feel amazing, have more energy, be more productive, and live longer. I was so impressed and inspired by Dr. O'Mara's interview that I had to invite him to come visit my community, the Steak and Butter Gang. So if you also want to learn more, you all can meet him by joining my next Steak and Butter Gang challenge. Just a heads up for my upcoming challenge, the guest speakers that will be visiting and speaking is Dr. Sean O'Mara. Dr. Anthony Chafee, Rebecca Heishman, Sarah Franklin, an amazing carnivore nutritional therapist practitioner, and Dr. Tony Hampton, who's a metabolic health expert and a family physician. If you think you'd be interested in joining my upcoming carnivore challenge, you can check out the URL shown on the screen or click the links down below in the description box to read more on the details and directly join us. Dr. O'Mara, welcome. Please do introduce yourself. Sure. So I am uh, Sean O'Mara. I'm a an MD, physician, and researcher from Minneapolis, Minnesota. I want first Emily and Amy to also introduce themselves mostly to you. Emily, you first. Hi, Dr. Romero. I am a coach with SBG, and I really focus on the fasting components in our group. So I've been doing this for a couple of years and have had a gazillion fasting questions that hopefully we'll be able to get into. So happy to have you here, Dr. Romero. I'm a member and a moderator for SBG. Uh, coach Emily and Coach Raymond are my coaches. And I'm your biggest fan. Well, I've seen you online. We've chatted a little bit. So uh, nice to nice to see you in person. Yes, we're all super fans here. I'm going to start off with my biggest question. You talk a lot about visceral fat versus subcutaneous fat. So what is the difference between these two types of fats? And why is visceral fat more important to focus on or maybe more dangerous than the other? You know, when it comes to research, you're looking at targets to try to identify what is the most relevant for your particular area of research. So in my opinion, cholesterol is fraught with noise. And I don't hear people talking about the fact that really when you pay attention to that particular metric, there's a lot of distraction about it. But one, your body makes it. Two, it's used to create cells and membranes and neuron, neuronal sheaths. The more of it you have, the higher amount of cholesterol, the, actually the lower mortality in many forms of disease. And the lower you know, your amount of LDL, the higher your mortality. So it's really filled with a lot of disease. It's got some good stuff to it and maybe some bad stuff. But what is all bad and you don't want is visceral fat and nothing in all my years of practicing medicine improves humans more than getting rid of visceral fat. Nothing, nothing else comes as close. You can think of visceral fat as this biological pump, this factory inside you, deep within your abdomen. It's constantly spewing out inflammatory substances. And so these inflammatory substances go throughout the body and wreak havoc. They just cause disease. So to your question initially, it's really important to be educated about the different types of fat that are within the body. And when it comes to subcutaneous fat and visceral fat, I like to say it's the difference is like the difference between bricks and clouds. It's enormously different. Visceral fat is bad, produces harmful inflammatory substances. Superficial subcutaneous fat, what I'm going to show you a picture of, is actually good. It produces a wonderful molecule called adiponectin. And if you've never heard about adiponectin, learn about adiponectin. Yep. It's associated with reducing the amount of cardiovascular disease. Superficial subcutaneous fat is associated with lower levels of inflammatory mo molecules, that particularly coming from visceral fat. And visceral fat is just the opposite, increases those inflammatory molecules. Let's answer your question. So behind me is this model. And this is a slice through a human being, sort of like a pizza slice. So you could think of a, uh, a pizza going through your abdomen, kind of at the air of your belly button, and mm -hmm. it creates an image like this. 
on an MRI, fat shows up as white and muscle shows up as dark. So let me orient your audience. This is uh, our muscles in the back. You're laying on your back. This patient's going through a scanner. And up here are the abdominal muscles, the top of your abdomen. And these are your side muscles, your obliques. Right there is your vertebral body. And these two oblong stuff are your psoas muscles making up your core. Now, we changed this image, adding some color to help differentiate between subcutaneous fat and visceral fat. So the subcutaneous fat is just underneath the skin, and it is painted yellow in the image above. And just to add some, you know, differentiation be between it and visceral fat, which is in red. Visceral fat is in the center part of your abdomen, and you can't access it unless you did surgery. You can't get to it. it you can't see it. It's hidden deep inside of you. I call it invisible obesity. Um, Carl Lenore from Superhuman Radio has a great term for it. He calls it radioactive fat. And that's a good way of thinking about it because it, it has this, this, you know, ability to radiate out danger and damaging substances. Subcutaneous fat you have an idea about because you can pinch this, this fat. It's right underneath your skin. So, you know, pinch the inch kind of expression where you grab hold of your tummy fat and you can feel it, that's subcutaneous fat. You'll never grab hold of visceral fat. That's deep inside of you. So anyway, I hope that explanation about the difference in terms of the biochemistry behind it is helpful. And also very importantly, where it's located. I know you talk about all different kinds of modalities to tackle this, but what a carnivore diet and fasting, how does that affect the visceral fat? The production of visceral fat is uh, multifaceted, and there are a lot of combinations and uh, contributors to its formation, and also the formation of other forms of uh, adipocytes or adiposity or fat. So there's some, you know, I mentioned one good fat is superficial subcutaneous fat. One bad fat is visceral fat, but there's uh, a few other bad players of fat that are also relevant for discussing and understanding your health. Carnivore and fasting, we see in terms of an intervention or strategy working with people that come to us for the purposes of trying to eradicate, uh, to eradicate visceral fat, that carnivore has an advantage over the elimination of visceral fat relative to some other dietary strategies, such as more carbohydrate dependent strategies or ways of eating. So if you really want to burn fat, then you don't want to be having carbohydrates creating an insulogenic response. We see carnivore has a stronger ability to preferentially burn visceral fat relative to subcutaneous fat. So for uh, unknown exact reasons, the fat that gets burned when you go carnivore, you, know, you just eliminate that visceral fat. I've seen in uh, people that are fruitarians, you eat an extremely high amount of carbohydrates. They tend to lose a lot of subcutaneous fat. Now, I've never scanned them because of that high degree of carbohydrates. I'm going to infer based on experience with other high carbohydrate diets such as vegans and vegetarians who have a higher amount of visceral fat when we scan them, that the fruitarians are probably right at the top of uh, the worst kind of dietary strategy uh, that you can employ to get rid of visceral fat. So uh, carnivore seems to be the best with the zero uh, amount of carbohydrates or the lowest amount of carbohydrates, followed by um, a keto diet, and, uh, and then a paleo diet or a low carbohydrate diet would be the most effective strategies. Other things can influence your production of visceral fat or make it more difficult to get rid of it, such as stress. If you're producing cortisol, you're going to um, uh, suppress lipolysis and you're going to contribute to more production of visceral fat and then poor sleep, not sleeping well. And then the ingestion or use of alcohol, alcoholic beverages, of course, you know, cheating, eating processed foods, seed oils, processed carbohydrates. And then the last one we notice is chronic exercise. And the exact 
mechanism that chronic exercise has in making visceral fat more difficult to eliminate. It may have something to do with simply, Emily, the fact that our bodies want to hold on to fat if we're doing a lot of long distance or durational exercise. So when we eat carbohydrates, the body in rec recognition or response to a lot of durational exercise is probably producing that visceral fat. Fasting accelerates uh, because of the lowering of insulin accelerates that fast burning. And we see uh, first and foremostly an elimination of visceral fat more than sub-Q fat. I have some follow-ups on that. It's so interesting. So a long distance runner though, they're going to present very uh, skinny. They're going to get lighter on the scale, right? And so, but what you're saying is they're actually getting fatter on the insides. You know, yeah. we take that win from the scale or from the, even from the size, but we could be causing a real storm inside. Yeah. So a lot of people just following numbers um, don't know what those numbers really are. So if you step on a bathroom scale and either you've gained weight or, or lost weight, the question that you really need to be asking from a um, health optimizing perspective is what is the tissue that's actually changing? Am I gaining uh, muscle or am I gaining fat? And if I'm gaining fat, what kind of fat am I gaining? Am I gaining subcutaneous fat that actually might be beneficial and protective because of the increased amount of adiponectin or am I gaining harmful visceral fat? So here's an example of a marathoner and this marathoner would run between uh, 10 to 12 marathons a year, a very large amount of marathons. And they ha have this red inside of them is visceral fat. They have an elevated amount of visceral fat inside and they just a paucity, a small amount of subcutaneous fat, the yellow on the outside. So in the research realm, we call these individuals tophies, thin outside, fat inside. And tophies, are, believe it or not, at a higher risk for bad outcome when it comes to cardiovascular disease than individuals who are obese outside or have a large amount of subcutaneous fat. So you can have an abundance of adiposity or fat tissue on the outside, and it actually helps protect you if you have this visceral fat on the inside. Not completely, but we see a lower incidence of mortality and reduced risk. And we see this in people that do a lot of chronic exercise. And we also see this in the type of personality that comes to see me. And those are what we call alpha personalities. And they typically are people who are running companies, executives, who know how to optimize a company and they want to try to optimize themselves. And so they're constantly kind of pinching themselves, looking at their fat. They, 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 they don't want fat or they're pretty good about getting rid of it. But when they show up, they're, they're uh, stressed out executives who are oftentimes just filled with visceral fat inside and uh, are stressed out running their companies. And that probably explains um, why they're, they're, they're toffee. But I would say about 95% of my clients who show up to me are toffee, but the majority of people that I scan in the hospital average are people that are, are fat outside and fat inside. So I call them fofies, fat outside and fat inside. So <laughs> tofies are not that common, but if you're a tofi, you're at a disadvantage. And so if you're listening today and you think you're thin and you're pinching yourself and you think, oh my gosh, I'm just a healthy runner and do all these marathons, you in fact probably have um, visceral fat inside and you may in fact be at a higher risk um, than an individual who's got a lot more palpable uh, subcutaneous fat outside their body and may not look as good as you do. There's some people who uh, mostly steak and butter gang members, we've come together through the end of the year to do the Omera protocol and incorporate some of your strategies. And a lot of these people are women who are pre-menopausal, post-menopausal, I've heard you talk about how uh, premenopause women don't have a lot of visceral fat. It doesn't hit them until postmenopause. So I wanted to ask you, because we do have a lot of people my age, 50 and older, we're incorporating not just the traditional sprinting, but rowing, air squats, things like that, if the, if the running aspect is too hard. So if you could also speak to that for 
the older uh, women who can't necessarily go out on the grass and sprint, but are using other modalities? So that's a really good and an important question and distinction. You know, what what influence and impact does uh, menopause have on, on females? So uh, unfortunately, it's a bad one. Things start <laughs> falling apart. And uh, the gynecological explanation is, you know, your uh, female reproductive system is shutting down. But I also point out that women um, have a lower level of disease. And so their enormous role in child rearing relative to the male, who typically for our existence probably have had less importance in child rearing and probably more importance in just DNA donor of DNA. Um, us males, we're expendable. We, we don't have the benefit of uh, as much protection against disease that women have. Nature allows them to live this really pretty, you know, low and sensitive disease up to about menopause. But males, we start accumulating visceral fats uh, in, in our teenage years, and it, it continues at a higher rate than uh, females all the way until we die. And we just keep accumulating this, this visceral fat. But women have a lower incidence of visceral fat until menopause. And then game on, watch out, because your bodies will start producing visceral fat at a higher rate than even males at that point. And I, I hope to get the attention of uh, the female audience with this one. When that visceral fat kicks in or menopause kicks in and that visceral fat starts being produced, not only do you increase your exposure to disease, but your body starts falling apart. One of the ways it manifests is your face changes. And so women have the ability to maintain pretty attractive feminine faces until menopause. Now, I don't know why nobody talks about this, but you can point to menopause wow. in your female relatives and say, this is where they started to become less attractive. It's not just getting old. It's the accumulation of visceral fat affecting the appearance of your face. So I work with my female clients to very aggressively attack visceral fat and prevent it from being formed so that they can preserve those useful faces. And I've been able to get my female clients and older clients to become models, you know, because there's so few women that are aware of visceral fat after the age of menopause. Mm -hmm. And women who, who become aware of visceral fat and work diligently to, to remove it, they have those lean faces uh, that they formerly had when they were teenagers, and in the absence of working to get rid of visceral fat, you get this uh, inflamed, puffy, uh, swollen face. And uh, that's not good. You know, it's nice to look attractive. But here's why you want to look attractive. You women continue to play an important role then as grandmothers. You know, the, the ability to impart knowledge and experience. And you want to be in your, your grandchildren's lives and relevant. And if you're running an organization and you're an older lady, you want to look attractive, not because you want male suitors, but you want people to pay attention to you. And if you look attractive, it says to our other members of the species, pay attention to this one because they know how to live well. Mm -hmm. And if they know how to live well, they can impart that knowledge to you. So you'll increase your ability to uh, be a greater, more effective influencer. So yes, it's nice to look attractive. But what you really want to do from a species standpoint, a biological standpoint, is be a better influencer. Well, I started researching your protocol about three months ago because of your video talking about your face, showing your face and the changes, those four pictures that you have. Because when I lost my weight from carnivore, I know I started losing some of the inflammation that you talk about. My face, when I look in the mirror, still freaks me out, like you talk about. I, I can't remember the term that you used, but that was that just sucked me right into all of your content. And then I just watched every single video and interview you had, who I was when I looked in the mirror before 
and who I am now, I still don't know who I am when I look at my face in the mirror because it's so much different. So as I'm going to sauna, doing the sprinting, doing the fasting, I have noticed my face has changed even more. All the cellulite is going away. I've been this weight before. I had a ton of cellulite. The cellulite is, is going away. And also my skin to the touch is so much different. I have really noticed those two things in my face and my skin. Amy, that first of all, I'm so happy over um, the accomplishment that you had. And uh, I'm glad that you have uh, achieved what you have achieved. That change in your face, maybe I'll just uh, take a quick moment to show you my own uh, facial change here, just so the sake of the audience. So this is this was my face before and my face over the past, uh, you know, 10 years, how much it's changed. And so what happened to me, and I think you were referring about is I got healthy so quickly that my face hadn't caught up to how I was feeling. And I started to identify again, because I felt like I was 20. I mean, really felt like, it. you know, people say that in line, well, I went through this period where I would look in a mirror and I would see this old person in the mirror and I had cognitive dissonance. My body, my brain could not recognize that face. It was like a stranger's face and it, car it, it produced a startle reflex that was so unsettling. It was anxiety evoking. It was just very, very alarming to look in the mirror and see this older person when I began to feel like I was 20 and it would startle me. So it's similar to how somebody that gets a face transplant has to go through counseling because there's a different looking face because it's so unsettling to them. Well, this happens to you once you really get optimally healthy and the protocols that we put together for the National Science Foundation so dramatically improve blood flow throughout the body, allowing recovery of the disease cardiovascular system, that it produces this enormous change in your face. You sound like you did a great job following that protocol. I'm super pleased that that happened to you. Are you on a carnivore diet currently, or do you have some carbs here and there? I am carnivore. The only foods that I eat are animal-based products. And then I take uh, garnishes with fermented foods. So I use a lot of uh, animal, uh, fermented animal products. Uh, they're chiefly dairy. So uh, I'll consume kefir and some yogurt, uh, but they, they will be zero carb or as near to zero carb as possible because of their, uh, the long fermentation to reduce through uh, reduction um, carbohydrates. And I consume some fermented cheeses and, uh, and, and that, that's about it for animal products. Maybe some sour cream occasionally. I do believe that uh, vegetables uh, have some microtoxins in them, these anti-nutrients, lectins, saponins, oxalates, these other substances that are problematic for us, um, mm -hmm. not in the acute sense, but more in the chronic sense. So the longer we consume them, small little exposures to them over a period of time are disruptive, <clears throat> I think, for mostly to our uh, epithelial cells <clears throat> and within our gastrointestinal tract. So I try to um, protect myself from that, uh, that influence by only uh, eating the fermented foods. But I consume those in a, in, a, in a fermented form for not their nutritional value as much as their microbial value. So I, I differ in a lot of other carnivore physicians because um, I have as an objective not only to eliminate visceral fat, but at the same time, to optimize my microbiome, my collection of organisms that live inside of my gastrointestinal tract. It's a very unusual strategy because we still are learning a lot about the microbiome. Fall in love with the microbiome, develop an interest in it, and start reading about it so you too can learn the various different strategies for trying to improve your microbiome. I just wanted to share one of my favorite places to shop for carnivore foods and household supplies. This is my monthly Thrive Market box. Thrive Market is an online membership-based grocery store, and I personally love it and use it every single month because I get such amazing discounts and deals. I'm always impressed by their selection of brands to choose from, especially as a carnivore. A majority of the things that I get are household supplies because I have a golden retriever, Simba. He 
sheds everywhere. This was on sale, the seventh generation disinfecting wipes. It's always nice to have some disinfecting wipes and I put this in my car. Next thing that I got is a must for us carnivores and our greasy, greasy plates, non-toxic dishwashing soap by the line Rosie, which is Thrive Market's very own line. It's excellent at cutting and cleaning grease off of plates, off of pans, pots, everything. Detergent. I have gotten at least 10 of these at this point because this is the only laundry detergent that I use now. The scent is nice and light. It is the lavender one. Very hypoallergenic for us sensitive skin people. This spray, it's an all-purpose cleaner. If you don't want the cleaning wipes, I use this to clean countertops, my stove top, especially when there's grease everywhere. I also use this to clean my bathroom countertop and my office space. And finally, I got these two awesome hand soaps. This is the brand called FAE, Thrive Market's very own line of personal care. I got both in the scent Bulgarian Lavender. You just pump it, comes out nice and foamy, and it gets the job done. They have an amazing filter option within their app where you can filter to just the ketogenic diet. That's what I do every single time I want to check out what they have. They often add new products, brands to their website. You will always have the best savings. If you find any lower price or better discount to somewhere else, they will always match it for you and you will always get free shipping on orders over $49. If you're interested in shopping from Thrive Market, you can get 30% off your first order plus a free gift worth up to $60. Just go to the URL shown on the screen, thrivemarket.com slash steak and butter gal. I've also linked it down below in the description box if you want a clickable link. Certain parts of your protocol have been absolutely foundational for my journey and so I've been doing these ones for four or five years. Um, fasting was you know one of the big ones and to, it took me a little bit later to find the carnivore approach. Um, but I was actually nervous to see you today because I was like, oh, he's going to see my face. No, <laughs> but <it> is, <laughs> like he's going to know any secret. If there's anything out there that's like not 100 percent, he's going to know it. Uh, so, no, these things have worked together so beautifully. And I've always thought it's just been well, there's a lack of inflammation. But when we say there's lack of inflammation, it's I it's like kind of like we're saying there's a lack of visceral fat that 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 was this thing that was inside that was causing this storm all throughout the body. Um, so I will say recently I've upped on the sprinting more and way back down on any kind of light jogging I was doing. Um, and I, but I gone for a hike with my husband, um, a couple of weeks ago and it was a hike I've done before, but it's, there's a pretty good incline and coming out of it. it was like a mile long and I didn't have to stop at all. Like, and I was thinking, is this because of this? Sprinting, so these doing these short bursts in such a small amount seem to have a profound effect on my cardiovascular capacity to just continue to go up this incline. That's making sense, right? Oh yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. So sprinting, um, regardless of what you do, if you're involved in any kind of athletic activity, uh, the addition of sprinting causes uh, improvement in uh, outcome and performance. So. It's, it's likely through its influence on VO2 max, and in particular, the mitochondria. So um, there's a mechanistic response on a, on a molecular level when you start sprinting, where from within your muscles, particularly your larger muscles, produce a larger amount of these messaging molecules called myokines. These molecules get produced at an enormous rate when you sprint. And compared to other... Um, in one particular study, other forms of exercise, they looked at 10 different forms of exercise. Sprinting was found to be the very best right at the top for producing these messaging molecules. And those molecules signal to your body to burn fat and to build muscle. And that is really uh, pretty key objectives for many people that are kind of uh, in the health space or just getting involved in trying to become more healthy. Uh, typically, they're coming from a perspective where they're typically more overweight and they want to lose that fat and gain muscle. So sprinting is just an imperative. If you're listening today and you're new to being healthy or you've been in the health space for a long time and you haven't started sprinting, well, both those categories of people need to avail themselves of the advantages of sprinting. So yeah, no surprise, uh, no matter what you do, if you start uh, adding in sprints, it's gonna improve your ability to, uh, to perform across 
uh, a variety, any, t- any, any particular metric that we've looked at has helped when people start sprinting. And for our viewers who are watching right now, is like a 10 second sprint sufficient every single day? Or does it have to be an X amount of seconds or minutes? Yeah. So first I'll say, you know, the public safety um, announcement, if you are new to sprinting and you're older, meaning you're in your 40s or above, then I would caution you to accelerate very, 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 very slowly because visceral fat has this uh, unfortunate uh, influence in our bodies that leaves us very vulnerable to getting an injury when we do uh, even a, you know, what, what is a fundamental and basic uh, activity like sprinting or another one that you probably don't think about is fighting. Maybe you just do a lot of jogging or aerobics or lower intensity exercise. You really want to um, sprint and have a variety of, of distances and times and numbers of sprints because nature uh, favors variety. Nature doesn't like set numbers and routines, muscle memory. Uh, nature sometimes would, would have in the past given us a short sprint. Sometimes nature would give us a long sprint. Sometimes we'd sprint once a day. Sometimes we might sprint 10 times a day So or 20. So I mix it up and I tell my clients that come to work with me um, to do a variety of different amounts of, of sprinting. But your sweet spot overall is probably around 6 to 15 seconds. It's generally maximum intensity all out sprinting for about 10, about 10 to uh, 11 seconds that, that before all your glycogen is expended. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's very interesting that uh, when you look at photographs of world-class sprinters, they have the best, 100 meter sprinters have the best body. And then as you increase the distances, their bodies literally start falling apart. I mean, right from the top, they just start regressing. So look at 200 meter sprinters, Look at 400 meter um, runners, look at uh, 800 meter runners, 1500 meter runners, 5000 kilometer runners, half marathons and marathons and ultra distance running. And you just see a a rapid decline in body uh, habitus, their musculature. I'm a recovered distance runner. I would run uh, 75 to 90 minutes every single day. You couldn't get me to, to not run. So I know... Uh, I know the the endorphins. I know the the commitment and the enjoyment that that I had for running, um, and I was oblivious to the fact that everybody's bodies seemed to be falling apart. The other interesting thing is I I found remarkable is how many people I drive by that are out there jogging and running, and the look of countenance on their face as though they are in the most miserable activity. Mm-hmm. But then when you see a sprinter, they have this game on face. It's, you know, it's like it just looks so admirable and attractive and uh, they just sprint for, you know, 10 seconds and they're done. So, yeah, it's uh, it's so you mix it up and uh, uh, just do, do a variety of different types of sprints, but accelerate very slowly until you get rid of that visceral fat so that you can accelerate more easily without the risk of a muscle strain or a tendon pole or tear. I have some follow-ups about fasting. We can kind of circle back to some of that. Um, so, and that, gosh, it just ties into everything because there's obviously huge microbiome benefits from that, but you're talking about a signaling perspective. And so what are some of the, um, the most pronounced signaling benefits that happen in a fast? And we do a lot of variety of fast in our gang. So we do anywhere from a 36 to a 72 are kind of the times that that we focus on and we like to do kind of the rolling fast. Um, but definitely wanted to hear your perspective and how this plays into everything as a lifestyle hack. Yeah. So um, the the benefit to the microbiome is enormous when we start fasting. And I think first and foremostly is because um, our body is finally getting, uh, getting a rest from the feeding, you know, that we are otherwise uh, too often or even incessantly doing. I, I came from an existence prior to when um, I uh, decided to become healthy where I was just constantly, excuse me, snacking on food. And I think that is the case with a lot of a, a lot of people, especially in the United States and, and westernized countries, 
we're just constantly putting food into our stomachs. And so when we fast, we give our bodies an ability to, uh, to reset and recover. And there's a biological state called autophagy, where the cells within the body start to clean up cellular debris and the waste products that are produced just from living, eating, and just going about our lives that uh, we unfortunately start to accumulate to our body's um, biological detriment. And so it's through autophagy that that, that harmful um, cellular debris is, is cleaned up. And the highest amount of autophagy really, while it's linear, typically doesn't really kick in until about 72 hours. So I um, try to fast uh, well, I do. I fast a minimum of 72 hours um, uh, every single week. So at least once once a week, I'm fasting for 72 hours straight. And then about uh, once a month, so every th uh, fourth fast uh, will be a 96-hour fast so that I get that uh, extended fast. So um, I actually think that that is probably more ancestrally in line with um, our species, how we lived. Uh, I just do not see a place where we would have been having the ability to, to eat abundantly all the time. Uh, we, uh, we hunted uh, large animals, uh, in particular uh, the woolly mammoth to complete extinction. And so uh, if you analyze um, the, the effect of that kind of a lifestyle, hunting it to an extinction, ex extinction means that we would have had an abundance of, of uh, meat uh, when we caught one and then uh, we, we would have gone a long period of time till we till we would have caught another one these these uh, enormous animals would have been extremely difficult to hunt with bows and arrows and uh, spears and so um, it would have been something that was very hard to to be able to achieve and no doubt uh, we would have had an extended you know, period of fasting in between. If you're new to the carnivore diet, you may find that you need to lean on electrolytes, whether that be salting generously, salting heavier in all of your carnivore meals, or just leaning on a high quality electrolyte supplement. The brand that I recommend is called Element. This is what it looks like, and they have a flavor called Raw Unflavored in the teal colored box. Zero stevia, additives, flavorings, just the three electrolytes, sodium, potassium, and magnesium. And it's measured out perfectly for you in each little packet like this. These packets are super easy to throw in your work bag. You can just take it on the go. I know a lot of you carnivores need to take multiple packets per day to work out in the gym, to not have muscle cramps. So if you're new to carnivore, you're having those adaptation symptoms, check out Element raw and flavored electrolytes. You all can get a free sample pack with any purchase as long as you go to the URL shown on the screen, drinklmnt.com slash sbgal or click on the link down below in the description box. The sample pack gives you all their flavors to try out, including the raw and flavored. Um, I try to get my clients to slowly adopt fasting as a beneficial strategy. And if you're listening today and you're not fasting, I would encourage you to consider fasting. There's a very interesting study that came out in 2021 that looked at um, the activity of autophagy uh, through uh, a model of a particular cell, a lysosome. And there's this interesting model called chaperone-mediated autophagy activity, CMA activity, where they applied that particular metric uh, with regard to stroke patients. And they found that people that had the highest amount of CMA activity never went on to have another stroke in this particular study. But those with the lowest amount of CMA activity went on to have another stroke. I find it remarkable that that study is not touted and shared with other people and that you know, others are aware of the benefits to fasting so that, you know, if you've had one stroke, you definitely don't want to have another stroke. This, the, that is the type of pathology that, uh, you know, renders a lot of people in nursing homes wearing diapers where they, they have to um, have their um, 
uh, bowel habits uh, attended to by a third person, somebody else, you lose the ability to go to the bathroom on your own and you're, you're stuck in diapers and you may not be able to communicate, you should be thinking about that. Everybody listening to the sound of my voice should adopt an awareness of just the wicked, harsh reality that strokes play and dramatically altering the lifestyle of people. Um, I'm an emergency medicine physician by training. I've seen all manner of death and disease come through the doors of an ER. And I have decided, you know, as an emergency medicine physician, the one disease I do not want to have is a stroke. I do not want to have strokes. I don't want to end up in that. I could, I could, you know, I wouldn't enjoy it. I could get cancer. I could die, you know, get a heart attack. Uh, I could uh, trauma. That that doesn't sound any fun at all. But at least, um, I in most cases, I'm not going to be stuck in diapers where I can't talk or I can't understand speech. Uh, or I'm relying upon other people to change my diapers. Um, I, I I just don't want to do that. So I have a lifestyle that I live to secure myself um, the healthiest lifestyle that I can have. I benefit all along with this awesome life where I get to go. I basically feel like I'm back in my 20s instead of being in my 60s. And mm -hmm. I get to go out and do awesome things that I formerly wasn't doing for the past um, 30 years. So it's, it's, a, it's an awesome thing to pursue um, optimizing your health. I will wrap up with this last question. So because you will be a guest speaker in our community. Yeah, we're definitely going to be doing your protocol together as a group. I just wanted to ask, you mentioned earlier in our conversation that you have executives come to you for help on how to up their game. I would be curious to know, and you don't have to like spill all the secrets, but like a general overview of what you tell these people. Well, it's an interesting, you know, topic to talk about to answer that question. A lot of people are like, why do you work with executives, not regular people? Well, <laughs> we worked with average people, you know, for the National Science Foundation. But the problem we had, and we worked with thousands of them, was they um, they wouldn't follow our protocol. So you know, we couldn't get them to stop eating pizza and drinking beer. And when we occasionally would have a business executive come in, they would. And so we analyzed as researchers, huh, what is the difference? Why do the executives follow the protocol that we developed for the National Science Foundation uh, much more, with much greater discipline than average individuals? And the reason is is that the executives have a, a, a vocation where they're applying key performance indicators where they're always optimizing, trying to optimize their company. And so they have familiarity with applying metrics to make things work better. And then when it came to average people, they didn't have that same vocational insight. And so their ability to um, understand these strategies and apply them in their own lives didn't have as much of a, a foothold in it. So um, now when executives show up, we, we provide them, you know, 47, you know, strategies. It can be overwhelming to people. And we kind of ease them into, you know, a group of other executives so that they can kind of be in a client group with other people doing these things. And they see how everybody's getting better. So when they come to show up um, to have their they're optimizing um, consultation and they go through all their MRI scans, um, they're much better suited. And the other difference is these MRIs that, you know, I, we, we use to optimize people are expensive, unfortunately. And so, you know, from a category or classification of people who um, can avail themselves to get those MRIs, uh, it typically is somebody at a higher socioeconomic level um, that have that. But I'll tell you, you know, some of my best clients, you know, still are people that are extremely motivated, don't necessarily have a lot of money. I've had, you know, some law enforcement personnel that are, are uh, you know, get a, a police officer salary and they're dipping into their savings, spending thousands of dollars on these MRIs and they're more committed. That That's a higher ask then a wealthy executive might be able to afford these MRIs. And so, yeah, when I get a uh, somebody with a, an, 
you know, lower or average socioeconomic, um, you know, uh, setting and they want to come and spend thousands of dollars, I know right away they are serious. They're going to really work it and crush it. And so that's that's what we look for, motivation, because they're the most beneficial subjects to study uh, because we don't have to do a lot of hand-holding explaining why you don't want to uh, eat bagels with cream cheese and uh, muffins and ice cream and pizza and beer. Uh, we just tell them what they got to do. They do it. We show them the change and uh, uh, we get great results that we can study. And ultimately, we're doing um, you know artificial intelligence and machine learning to teach a machine these changes and be able to read it. So it's really just a fascinating um, uh, area of research that I just enormously enjoy. Well, this will be continued in the Steak and Butter Gang. I wanted you to share where everyone watching this video can find you and can find more content from you. So I'm in the social media space because uh, conventional healthcare just doesn't give me a voice or an ability to reach people, yeah. you know, with my message of trying to reverse disease and optimize your health. So you can get me on Twitter, uh, Instagram, and YouTube on the same handle at Dr. Sean O'Meara. And uh, I also have a website that's just my name. I'm a startup now, so we'll be changing that name to um, our, our startup company eventually. But for the time being, that's that's the name of our little startup. And, you know, the concepts are much bigger than an individual. Well, as soon as we come up with a clever company name, you'll see that that website change. So awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. O'Mara. I will keep in touch. What I love about Dr. O'Mara's approach is that it is concise, easy to follow, and doable. It is not rocket science to do what he recommends. I personally will be implementing all of his recommendations starting today, and I will be documenting on YouTube in future videos, as well as daily updates on Instagram, in my stories, and on my feed. So if you'd like to follow along my progress as I follow Dr. O'Mara's protocol, follow me on Instagram and make sure you're subscribed to my YouTube channel here. If you'd like to join me in doing the carnivore diet and Omera's protocol together, I will be implementing his practices and recommendations in my upcoming carnivore challenge. My team of coaches and I will be doing Omera's protocol in this coming month's challenge. We will be providing guidelines, recommendations throughout the month so that all the challengers who join are motivated and on track with us. On top of that, Dr. Omera will be visiting my community, the Steak and Butter Gang, and answering any any questions that the challengers have personally and live on Zoom. For this upcoming challenge, I will be featuring the guest speakers shown on the screen, Dr. O'Mara, Dr. Chafee, Dr. Hampton, Rebecca Heishman, and Sarah Franklin. To join us, go to the URL shown on the screen, sbgmeetup.com, or check out the links down below in the description box for more details and to directly sign up. Don't forget to hit like if you enjoyed this video and make sure to stay subscribed to my channel Turn on those bell notifications if you don't want to miss my future videos and connect with me on Instagram and Twitter at Steak and Butter Gal. I also started a second channel right here on YouTube for all things beauty, piano, music. I've already posted my makeup routine, my everyday morning skincare routine. If that interests you, check out my second channel called Bella Ma linked down below as well. If you're looking for an amazing place to shop all things carnivore staples and clean non-toxic household cleaning supplies, I highly recommend Thrive Market. I always order my favorite products, everyday necessities at the lowest price possible. You all can get 30% off your first order plus a free gift worth up to $60 if you go to the URL shown on the screen, thrivemarket.com slash steak and butter gal. I've also linked them down below in the description box. All right, I'm gonna go on a walk with some now probably go play some ball with him this is actually our second time going out to the park but the weather is just so nice and i really want to savor the last of seattle summer weather before it starts getting foggy and cold and rainy um, so that's what we're gonna do i hope you all enjoy the rest of your day and i will see you in my next video spg out <laughs>